Today, we welcome two outstanding writers, Debbie Maycomer and Linda Lil Miller. I can spend the entire interview reading a list of their accomplishments, but I'll try to keep it brief. Linda, we'll start with you. You are a number one New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. You've offered, authored more than 100 historical and contemporary novels and 17 different series. As the daughter of a town marshal, most of your novels reflect your love of the West. Why do you feel your books resonate with your audience so well? I think they feel included. Uh, this is what I go for to try to make them feel included that, that if they were in the story with these characters, they would be welcome where the characters are. They would be friends of the characters uh, and they would receive recognition. I think people are lonely. I, um, they're, you know, people work in a cubicle with, with now that they're, if they're back to work or they work in their living room and they're so isolated and things are so polarized these days. It's a, these are difficult times for everybody. So I like to make them feel included and part of a family, part of a group that they have a place. I think so many people feel invisible. And as I've said before, I like to say, if you ride into the ranch at the McKetricks or any other characters of mine, there'll be a place for your horse in the barn and a place for you at the table. And I, I want to create a welcoming, um, a sense of being welcome. I love it. I love it. Debbie, you are also a number one New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. You have more than 200 million books in print worldwide. Your novels have spent more than a thousand weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And you've also written bestselling cookbooks, adult coloring books, children's books. Why do you feel your books resonate with your audience so well? I think because uh, it's a learning process as an author. I realize that when a, somebody uh, you know, pays $27 for a story of mine, they have expectations and, the, and my goal as an author is to meet those expectations. So uh, they know if they pick up one of my books, they're gonna read a good story that's provocative and relevant and told in a creative way and that they're gonna come away feeling positive and uplifted. And that's what's important to me as an author to, to give to my reader and not take from them. Debbie, when did you feel first feel success as an author? <laughs> I love this question. I love this question. <laughs> I, when I started out, I had a whole list of everything I wanted on a, uh, a sheet of paper. You know, I wanted to go on tours. I wanted to have audiobooks. I wanted to be on the bestseller list. And I looked at that list and it was I, 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 I. And I realized at that time that it isn't what I should want. It's what I should give. And that's when I chose my mission statement, and that is to be a blessing. I want my readers to feel blessed when they read my books. But on a side note, I can tell you when I really felt like an author, a successful author is when my name and the title of my book were an answer on Jeopardy. <laughs> That's fantastic. Linda, what about you? When did you first feel successful as an author? Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know, yesterday? <laughs> uh, Linda. It's, well, you know, I've done well, but, you know, so have a lot of people. But um, I think that I look at that ongoing. It's, it's kind of still something that I'm striving. I mean, I know I'm successful and definitions of success, but maybe if I go back to what I said initially, uh, maybe I was a success from the first time I made somebody happy by reading one of my books. They... Uh, you know, a book costs money, as Debbie was mentioning. Mine are mostly hard or paperback, but now it's like seven ninety nine or even twelve ninety nine for a paperback book. And I always think, you know, that's a pot roast, or you know, that's that's a, a really nice chicken or something. People are sacrifice sacrificing sometimes to buy these uh, stories, and Debbie's absolutely right. They deserve to find comfort, solace, distraction from their problems. I believe Debbie provides all of that in her stories. Her warmth is legendary. People feel, um, feel very welcome and part of her community. And I strive for the same thing. 
Linda, what's one thing you wish someone had told you about the publishing industry when you first uh, became an author? Um, that someday you would need to promote everything yourself. <laughs> when I when I came on board, and Debbie would probably say the same thing, but it was very close, a matter of months. Um, all you had to do was write a good book. That was it, you know, and a publisher did the rest. Well, this is just no longer the case. You have to have a good social media platform because that's where everything is, is focused. So and that's my answer. Debbie, what about you? What's, what's one thing you wish someone had told you about the publishing industry when you first started? I think uh, how hard it is. You know, if I, I still would have done it, but being an author is, is hard work, a dedication, and you give up a lot. There are sacrifices to be made. And uh, like Linda said, it isn't easy. Um, when we first started out, the publisher took care of all of the publicity. They're the ones that, that took on that role. Now that's handed down to the authors. And it's our responsibility to do a lot of it. Debbie, let me ask you, you kind of touched on this. Um, writing is a really solitary endeavor to a certain degree. And it's also getting published is extremely competitive, but it also seems like the writing industry that the, the two of you are a great example of that. It's a close knit group. Um, it seems more supportive than other industries. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because so oftentimes, especially when Linda and I first started out as, as authors, it was a small group. I mean, it was a man's world. It was, you know, women creating stories for women about women. And uh, there was a lot against us. I think the, the publishing world didn't realize that um, the women were the ones that bought the books. And I can remember there was a woman's fair in town and, and I had heard a statistic that I told my husband that 75% uh, of all books are bought by women. And, and my husband looked at me and he says, Debbie, 70% of everything is bought by a woman. <laughs> and uh, I think finally uh, New York realized that and the advertising world recognized that because they started these women's fairs for that very reason. So I think their close-knit community of authors, and especially women authors, is that um, we knew we were breaking ground. We were cr uh, creating new territory, and we were there to encourage and support each other. Linda, what about you? Do you have anything to add to that in terms of why you think it's such a supportive network in general? I think Debbie pretty much covered it. She and I had a special relationship of swapping. We've been friends for years, swapping chapters at the end of the day and walking together every day. And it's, uh, it's true that she could lay down for a nap and get up with a trilogy, which always really irritated me. <laughs> anyway. Well, you talked about something interesting there. Um, in terms of, you know, as a writer, you sometimes need to be accountable. You know, you need someone to hold you accountable for writing or at least have writers groups that help you out. What type of a team do you think an author needs to be successful? What type of support do you think an author needs to be successful? Well, today, um, I think you need someone who is uh, brave enough to be honest with you when you're successful. Sometimes people are afraid to tell you that you're mistaken about something or that you're just acting like a poop. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to shape up. I had a cousin like that and also a friend in, in Debbie and uh, several of my other friends, you know, they've kind of, uh, I think you have to be accountable uh, more than, uh, more than uh, getting the work done. You also have to be accountable to the reader. I, I try to keep in mind that, you know, fit probably kids who probably shouldn't, maybe they're 15 or 16, they probably shouldn't read my books, but they do. So I don't want to paint. Um, my heroines are never weak. They never need this man to survive. <laughs> you know, they have their own thing going. And, and if the romance doesn't work out, they're going to be fine. N you know, maybe not as happy for a while till they meet somebody else. But I didn't want uh, kind of the old fashioned thing was where the guy was like, ridiculously older and he you know 
uh, he was very dominant and that's just not something I want to support. So I think we're in, accountable in a lot of ways that we have to think about how this might affect people. Debbie, what about you in terms of writing and your team and accountability for your writing? Um, where do you stand on that? Well, I do have a team. Uh, this is a lesson I learned from my father. My father had his own business and he hired people to do what he didn't do well so that he could do what he did well. And so I have a wonderful supportive team around me that helped me to do what I do best and that is to write. And I'm, and I'm grateful for them because that gives me the opportunity to do what I love. Which kind of brings us to the, the culmination of, of when you try to get published, you're working with another entire entity at that point in time. Debbie, what do you think is the most, um, some of the more important parts of the author publisher relationship? I think probably the most important thing is to remember that you both are after the same goal. And that goal is to create the best story possible. And so I think uh, too many people, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a sign of those that have um, are new or book years, so to speak, in that they become very defensive about their stories. And I think it's just so important to remember that your editor has the same goal as you do to have a best-selling book, to create a story that is going to be universally loved. And so you need to work together. And Linda, what about you? What do you think are some of the more important parts of an author and publisher I relationship? I agree with that. They, there's a saying that if you uh, represent yourself in a court of law, you, you have a fool for a liar. Well, it, the same is true of writers who refuse to be edited. It's impossible to be completely objective about your work, you know, and, and I think anybody who won't be edited, who refuses to cooperate, uh, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And the reason is just exactly what Debbie said, that, that we're on the same team. We shouldn't be looking for reasons to bicker. And it does happen. It happens. But basically, well, they want the same thing we do. They want the book to be successful. They want it to make ha people happy. So they'll come back and buy more from that publishing house, but also more from us in the future. Linda, what advice would you give new authors about the publishing industry today? Well, I, um, I get that question and it's changed so much. Mm -hmm. I, I would want them to be aware going in that they need to reinvest their initial advances into things like social media. If some of these young people can probably do it all themselves and still write. Uh, to me, that's my worst nightmare is having to do 42 postings, you know, before I can start page one. Um, so that I would tell them to, um, first of all, be very persistent. Second, respect your editor, listen to them. You don't have to like them and they don't have to like you, but you do have to be a decent human being and cooperate. There's a reason for this interaction. So I would tell them to try to be as professional as possible, to try to leave their, uh, their personal ideas and other things uh, that don't relate uh, out of the equation. It is business. And I often get this where people are, <laughs> It's terrible, but I'll end up with two books in a trilogy. And this was back further in my career. And then the trilogy is never finished because publishing is a business. And it, it's, it's run by numbers. And so if you don't, uh, if a book doesn't sell or a series, you know, the first two parts of a trilogy in my case, if they don't sell as well as say my Western romances, which are my, for me are my best selling uh, writing, they're, the guys who and women who uh, keep the books, they're just not going to go for that. They don't care if you're a nice person. They don't care if you, uh, you know, uh, water your flowers every day. They don't care. Their job is to make a profit for a company. And so I would like people to keep that in mind. And it, it's a delicate balance because I've often thought to be a writer, you have to be so very empathetic. 
And yet you, at the same time, if you read, no matter who you are, if you read your reviews, you're going to be devastated because there are some people who just love not to like anything. And so I would tell them, don't read your reviews. I, I'll listen like I look, oh, that's a good average four and a half stars. I like that. I don't go into it because I don't want to, I, I don't want to be devastated. I care so much about these people. They're very real to me, the people in my stories and the people who read them. So I guess I'm going on and on, but yeah, I would, I would want them to be professional and hopefully not to make the same million and one mistakes that I made along the way. But mistakes are very good teachers. Debbie, what about you? What advice would you give young authors about publishing today? Oh, I would say to create the best story they possibly can and, and just forget about everything else. Just concentrate on your work and write the story. And uh, uh, there's a saying out there, and, and I know Linda and I are very familiar with this, is write the damn book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many people talk about, it. in fact, just recently I got a, a, a message from a son of one of my high school friends that wanted all this advice about writing. He wanted the name of an agent. He wanted the name of the publisher. He was asking me all these questions. And I said, well, um, what is your genre? He says, well, I haven't started writing yet. I'm just trying to. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a great one. We want to know the name of your agent and they haven't written a word. Yeah. <laughs> No, or, the, yeah. or the one that the, just recently I got a, um, it was a high school girl. They asked if I would do an interview with her uh, because she would, wanted to be a writer. And so I'm talking to her. It's a Zoom call. And she says, you know, I'm really struggling with it. Um, I just get to a certain point and I just can't go any farther. And I says, well, how many, you know, how far are you into the book? And she said, five pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So sit down and write, you know, a writer writes and, you know, people, you're, you're assuming here in this question that they're already published, but it, there are so many, many talented authors out there that, you know, it, you have to have the passion. You just have to be passionate about it. it uh, you know, you asked an, an earlier question about what I would do if I wasn't an author, what Linda and I would possibly, you know, do as different people if we weren't authors. And, you know, quite honestly, there isn't anything else I would rather do. I wanted this more than I wanted anything I've ever wanted in my entire life was to tell stories. That's wonderful. That's wonderful that you can, that you can make a career out of a passion like that. Yeah. Um, Debbie, what's the most challenging thing for you about writing? This may sound silly, but it's finding the time. I mean, life, uh, life gets complicated. You know, there's, I have to set aside certain hours every day to write. And uh, that, that time is sacred. That time is sacred. And I, it, it, the balance, creating that balance in your life, I think. There's demands as a, a you know, wife, a mother, a grandmother, uh, a career person. I mean, these are the things that every woman faces. And, well, every man too. You know, it's finding that balance and maintaining that balance. And, and what about you, Linda? What's, what, what's the most challenging thing for you about writing? Starting. <laughs> I'm a master procrastinator, so I have to make a deal with myself. I'll say, okay, just, what, just write a paragraph or even a sentence. Well, if, and, and for some weird reason that works for me, because once I've written that, I, I got to go on to the next sentence and the next and the next. So like Debbie, I have a very specific uh, time. I have a page quota that I try to reach 10 pages a day and that's draft. But we were, I, I wanted to touch on uh, uh, telling young writers also to not edit as they go along. I mean, obviously you're going to make changes. You're going to rewrite at the end of the day, but I myself, and I've been a professional for 40 years but I have got in that trap where I'm over editing and, and that will bog you down, at least in my experience, that bogs me down more than anything else is when I start second guessing, you know. So sometimes, and Debbie and I used to say this a lot in speeches, is that you have to write, be willing to write badly for a long time before you can write well. And I think that's true of anything. 
But I think people expect to win the Pulitzer, you know, <laughs> it's, I've had people say to me, when I have a free weekend, I'll write a romance novel. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, I'm not even touching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they clearly never put pen to paper. Um, Linda, let me ask you this. What can, publicity aside, what can authors be doing to help develop themselves as writers and hone their craft when they're not actually writing? Wow, there's so much, uh, the, there's so much, uh, we were mentioning social media, there are a couple of websites that I super, super love or apps. One is called Masterclass and they have people on there like James Patterson and Judy Bloom and, and you know, R.L. Stein. They have chefs, they have artists, they ha even have singing, which I'm never gonna be a good singer, no matter who teaches me, but you know, I might not be, but my, but one of my characters might at some point be. And so um, I, I still benefit by learning that. So I like masterclass, I like Skillshare, apparent, especially there's a five hour class on uh, Skillshare where you learn to fly a small plane. Now I am not, I can barely drive a car. I'm not gonna fly a plane, but one of my characters might. And if I, if I invest, five hours and some note taking into that class or, or one like it, that I can create a more believable character. And yeah, so that's, I think that's important to learn. Also, there's always reading and good books come out on writing all the time. Uh, reading other writers is, you know, learning how, you know, the turn of a phrase or, you know, reading, uh, I think, is still the most fundamental thing that you do to no that's fantastic i mean i know we laugh at the phrase write what you know but it, it it's it's almost write what you know and if you want to write about something else go learn about it you know because it's about exactly. it's about believability in your writing you don't need to know yes. about something but you certainly need to go learn about it if you're going to write about it so no that's fantastic now debbie what about you what what can authors be doing to help themselves hone their craft when they're not just writing I think they need to experience life. Get out there and do things. Um, you know, Linda and I used to do these things for our birthdays. We would do, uh, I took Linda on a gliding plane just because <laughs> these life experiences are so fun. We once went on a float plane ride and, uh, you know, we just do life exper experience life. Get out there. And because it's yeah. such a, an indoor solitary profession, it's just so important to get out and, you know, plant a garden, interview your neighbor, you know, well, not interview, but, you know, meet your neighbors. Just get out and enjoy life. And all of that enriches the writing. This is so true. Well, I want to thank you two so much for this interview today. Um, Debbie, where can people find more about your um, writing? Oh, um, websites, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you look for Debbie Maycomber, I can be found. <laughs> Fair enough. Linda, what about you? Same thing. Just type Linda Lale Miller and you're going to come up with all kinds of things. Just ignore the criticism. <laughs> <laughs> thank you two so much for your time today.